Regulatory T cells play a very important role in preventing your immune system from attacking its own tissue, thinking its huh. own tissue is foreign. So obviously it plays a very important role in autoimmune disease. Um, so, so how do we get more of these T cells that are good? Well, that's, well, you know, I think one, one thing to keep in mind would be what, what regulates the gut microbiome. One of the major things that regulates the gut microbiome is what I just said, eating a, a diverse ar array of fermentable fiber. Um, because Give me an example. What's, what's a diverse array? So you have blueberries, you have, um, you know, you have nuts, mushrooms, mm -hmm. you have some, you know, dark leafy greens. These have different types of, or, you know, you've got onions and garlic. Those have a different type of fermentable fiber. Um, there's, that should be differentiated from um, non-fermentable fiber, which would be cellulose, broccoli. ligands. Well, just like, well, broccoli has fermentable fibers. And, uh -huh. and, but yeah, most of, like, most of the, the bulk of fiber in plants is non-fermentable. Is, is non so what that's doing is basically just helping move stuff through the intestines, right? Pushing mm -hmm. it out. The fiber. So, that's important. The fiber is pulling it down and cleaning it out. Cleaning and it out, right. And that's also important. But, but the fermentable fiber, the stuff that's, that can be eaten by this bacteria in our gut, like that is the good stuff. That's really? what's allowing the bacteria to make short-chain fatty acids. So what are the top three to five tea foods? I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to simplify for myself these foods well, that can really develop that. Yeah, what, are the, what, would, you, what do you different. Eat? So the thing is different foods have different types and different oh. types feed different types of bacteria. So if you want, you know, like for, one, for example, some people want to hear, oh, well, I can supplement with inulin. I can get an, an inulin powder. Inulin is a type of fermentable fiber. You can find it. Um, you can find it in a variety of plants. Uh, I think onions, for example. Um, but, you know, if you only eat inulin, then you're going to be you're going to be basically feeding a certain certain types of bacteria that that use inulin or so you know that so ferment. the variety is what you're looking for. That helps with the diversity, you know, because these bacteria are playing different roles. Uh, so Interesting. you know, there's. So I have been under the assumption that eating the same thing every day is good. It's like eating a clean, like a little bit of chicken, lots of veggies. And eating it pretty much every meal is the right way to go in terms of like my health, nutrients, in terms of like body composition, how I want to look and feel. Is that something that I should be uh, going away from and diversifying what I eat every day? Or well, it sounds like you just said, you said vegetables. That's like a, that's a lot in vegetable. There's a lot of types of vegetables, right? Uh -huh, so it's kind of yeah. nice. Look, I'm just as guilty, like for convenience, I'm busy, like I know my, my husband gets tired of it, but I'm like the same. It's so much easier to have the same thing. Same thing every day. Meals because I, I find the thing that's healthiest and easiest to make. Um, and, you know, there's days where, let's say, you know, I'm not, I'm not working all day. Then I can, I can be more creative and I have more time. But um, generally speaking, it's easier to, to kind of stick to the same thing. But if, it's you, nice. if you were going to, let's say you came up with a, a new company, a product that was a, a meal that you had to have the same meal every day for lunch and dinner and snack. And this would be the, the thing that you could sell to people. What would be included in that meal that you were like, you know what, if you, ha if you don't have the, all the variety and time to make these foods all day, but if you could do this three times a day, you're setting yourself up for a really good immune system and good gut, gut bacteria. The same, act the same meal three times a day or yes, different meals? Same yeah. meal. So I would say oh, basically no. omega, I would, I would get salmon. I would get wild Alaskan salmon. Um, and, and that's because salmon is one of the best sources of the marine omega-3 fatty acids, EPA and DHA, which are extremely important for health and particularly brain health, but even cardiovascular health. I mean, just, there's just been so much emerging ev evidence um, showing that the omega-3 fatty acids are really important for brain health and for, okay. uh, for cardiovascular health. Piece of that wild caught salmon. That would be yeah. my protein. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also lowest in mercury. There's, there's like four micrograms of mercury, or sorry, two micrograms of mercury per four ounces cooked. Um, so that's really low in mm. mercury. Um, and I would and definitely, cooked, cooked or raw fish? Well, actually cooking it even lowers the merc mercury bioavailability even more. So definitely, and raw, you don't want to like, I think there's too much concern with parasites and all yeah, that. So yeah. I would say cook. cooking me. Okay. Number <laughs> and two. Number two, I would say it, I have to. And in fact, I always feel 
like I'm depriving myself, and I'm kind of quoting my mentor here a little bit, if I don't have dark leafy greens with a meal. Mm -hmm. Literally, like every meal, I like to have dark leafy greens. And, and what are the top I would say, two or three I would say kale greens? because I would also like to have my sulforaphane. And sulforaphane, um, it, it plays an important role in so many – there's just so many – so much evidence that sulforaphane, I think, uh, may be important for longevity. Um, but so that would be my greens. Kale. And the, okay. yeah, I, I'd like maybe sauteed. Sauteed would be good um, because it's okay. just you can't really eat raw kale unless you put so it in a smoothie. Hard. <laughs> yeah. Unless exactly. you put it in unless a smoothie. Put, exactly. Which, which I actually do. I drink my smoothie. I have um, blueberries. So maybe I would add the, the avocado. I'd have an avocado and some blueberries, a little, a little cup of blueberries. And that's it for your meal. Yeah, that would be my, that would be my so meal. You would have wild Alaskan salmon, dark leafy greens, sa sauteed kale. Uh, you'd have blueberries and some avocado. And an avocado. If you ate those four things every day, multiple times a day, <laughs> that, if that's what you could only eat, you feel like it would set you up for a good amount of success. I do. I do. Yes. Well, there's a lot of, so in kale, um, kale is probably one of the best sources of lutein and zeaxanthin, which are what are called carotenoids. And carotenoids you're probably familiar with, or you're, and people listening or watching this are probably familiar with beta carotene. That's like the probably most famous, that's like the poster child for carotenoids. Um, beta carotene is a carotenoid. Uh, it has antioxidant activity itself, but it also can be converted into vitamin A. Uh, lutein and zeaxanthin are really interesting because they accumulate in two regions, in the rods and cones in the eye, and they're, they've been shown to play an important role in preventing age-related macular degeneration. Mm. But they've also really um, been shown to play an important role in, in the brain. And there's this accumulating evidence that this stuff is accumulating in the brain and it really hasn't been known why. And, and the reason I say that is because lutein and zeaxanthin, because of their molecular structure, they're really good at basically sequestering singlet, o singlet oxygen. Um, and, and, and that plays a role in like damaging the eyes, so like when yeah. you're out in, in the sun, exposed to the sun, and you know, cataracts and things like that. Yeah. So that, that plays a role and you're basically eye, eye aging, quote unquote, right? But in the brain, there's no light. So why is this stuff accumulating in the brain? And um, there's just been quite a few studies over the past five years or so, maybe the last seven years, uh, correlating it with cognitive function and um, improved cognitive function and delayed brain aging. So, I, and, the, and there's like studies, you know, correlating plasma levels of lutein and zeaxanthin with, um, in, you know, improved cognitive function. There's been uh, randomized controlled trials supplementing with lutein and zeaxanthin, improving cognitive function in elderly adults. Um, it's always nice to have a randomized controlled trial because that really helps establish causation when you have, you know, these studies looking at associations at the end of the day, it's an association and you never know, it could be mm -hmm. some other factor, right? Playing sure, a role. Sure. But um, so the lutein and zeaxanthin and kale, you've got, you've got some fiber, um, a little bit of fermentable fiber. You've got the sulforaphane, which um, has been shown to increased, it's been shown in, in, in human studies to increase glutathione. Um, in plasma and also in the brain, mm. which is amazing. Glutathione is one of the major antioxidant systems in the body and particularly in the brain. And I know we were kind of chatting before, before we got started uh, about your former life as a, what I didn't realize even existed was this which arena football, you called yes. it. And it sounds like that TBI could be a, a big thing uh, yeah. in, in arena a lot of, football. A lot of hits in the head, that's for sure. Right. Well, glutathione is one of the major antioxidants in the brain. It plays a very important role, um, particularly with any injury in the brain. Mm. So um, sulforaphane increases glutathione. It increases the, the enzymes that make glutathione and use it and subsequently increases glutathione levels. I saw some, maybe it was another doctor. I'm trying to figure out who said this, that there was some research actually potentially saying that kale was not good for you, that it had some negative side effects as well. I don't know if you've seen that research or if that's just something. There's I'm... no research I've seen on that. I've okay. heard it, um, okay. but it, it, it's just, it's one of those things where people like to talk about potential anti-nutrients and um, one of the, what they're calling an anti-nutrient is actually sulforaphane mm -hmm. um, because it can compete with iodine for transport into the thyroid. And, um, but 
there's been studies, so for human studies where they've loaded up with sulforaphane and there's been no effect on thyroid function. Um, those were short-term, like a week-long studies. There have been long-term studies on animals that have actually that actually have hypothyroidism. They were given sulforaphane, and believe it or not, actually they were given broccoli sprouts uh, extract, which um, is one of the best. I hear those are amazing for you. Yes. So broccoli sprouts have like a hundred times more sulforaphane than mature broccoli. Well, anyway, so my should we point throw some broccoli is, sprouts on top of the kale or the avocado or the avocado? The broccoli sprouts actually. Would if I could add more, I would absolutely put the broccoli sprouts in there. Yes. Okay. Um, but the but the, the my point was that the animals that had hypothyroidism, it didn't make their hypothyroidism any worse at all. In fact, it helped uh, the antioxidant status of their thyroid. It improved some functions. Wow. So I think it, that doesn't mean you know people with hypothyroidism shouldn't be you know weary or concerned about consuming too much sulforaphane, particularly if they're not getting iodine. Most people aren't iodine deficient it's it's like in salt you know most people are eating foods that already have salt in them now um you know iodine so iodine deficiency not is not a big thing um particularly in the united states but uh so i would i would say that 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 uh those statements by some people that are mm -hmm. kind of more into the the camp of don't eat any plants right um, aren't aren't really not enough um, research on it yeah there's not, there may be, you might find one study with one case report with a female who had some crazy funk disease or something. Mm -hmm. And she was juicing like, you know, un, just ungodly amounts of kale every day where it's like, I mean, okay, like maybe there, maybe you can create a situation sure, sure, where, sure. you know, it, there's it not enough research harmful. backing it though. Yeah. But yeah. So I'm curious about this. You have some great points here. I love your five foods that we should be eating for every meal. Um, now as a, I'm a 37 year old man. But I've got the, I like to think, curiosity and imagination of a seven-year-old. But I also have the palate of a seven-year-old. And I don't like blueberries. I don't, I don't like avocado. I'm the pickiest eater. I'm probably a pickier eater than your, than your child. And I want to ask you for the picky eaters of the world who don't eat berries and don't like avocado or aren't creative enough to go that far and they're limited in their creative thinking in terms of foods is it better to just have the supplementation the vitamins and supplements that are the exact same nutrients and just take the supplements and vitamins as opposed to the actual food itself or is the organic fresh caught food always better than the the fish oil or the blueberry vitamin what do you think yeah, about that yeah so um i think that that it, there's huge differences when you're talking about eating a food uh, versus taking a supplement. And I do think, for example, a multivitamin supplement is, is, I take it every day and I think it's great insurance to make sure because, you know, there are 40 essential micronutrients, which are vitamins, minerals, and essential fatty acids and amino acids we have to get from our diet. Um, and they're important for not only helping us, you know, not die, for example, right. you know, scurvy, but also for long-term function, for a the way we age, um, preve mm. preventing insidious damage. But there's also a variety of these compounds we don't know about. You know, there's the fermentable fibers that are feeding the gut microbiome and which are making all these chemicals, like little drug factories in our gut that are regulating the immune system. We've got polyphenols, like blueberries have been shown, you know, to inc in multiple clinical studies, it's been shown to increase blood flow to the brain and improve cognitive function and memory in both young adolescents um, and older adults. Hmm. Uh, so, and this was, this was due, thought to be due to the anthocyanins and blueberries. And, you know, so there's, you know, food has so many components, probably so many things we haven't even discovered yet. You know, so many compounds that were just, you know, there's this new, new compound that was discovered in dark leafy greens called um, sulfa, sulfa quinol, quinolobone or something, which has now been shown to like have a specific purpose of feeding the gut microbiome, kind of like the fermentable fiber. So it's one of those things where, you, you know, food has so much to it and there's so, many, there's so many parts to the story. It's not just about getting the vitamin, right? It's not just about getting that one mineral. Um, so, um, and I will say that uh, in my, when I was a postdoc with Dr. Bruce Ames um, at the Children's Hospital uh, Oakland Research Institute, uh, there was a, a variety of clinical studies that I was a part of where they, my colleagues had designed this, this nutrient dense bar that had a variety of vitamins and minerals. It also had DHA, which is one of the marine omega-3 fatty acids found in mm -hmm. fish. And it also had fiber, a fiber matrix. 
and there was a variety of studies that we were doing in obese and lean individuals. And so it was like the showed, ultimate food bar. It was, it like, was like everything you need in this. It meal. was like the you know it was like the micronutrient bar where you were giving the micronutrients, but you were delivering them with a with a food matrix Ooh. like fiber, right? Yes. And and so there's all these benefits that were found from this from this bar that were particularly benefits found in people that were overweight or obese, that we didn't ask them to change their diet, they were eating their same diet, but you give them this bar on top of that and you would have improvements, you would have improvements. <laughs> and in inflammation, in like, you know, um, HDL cholesterol, which is a good type of cholesterol, um, you'd, so you'd have all these improvements. But if you took away the food matrix, if you took away that food matrix and just had the bar without the fiber um, and just the, the micronutrients, some of those benefits would go away. And, so the, but if the you matrix... gave the fiber by itself, the benefits would go away. It was mm. the whole package. It was everything together that was important. So, you know, wow. with that said, um, I do think there is a place for supplementation and, um, you know, particularly with fish oil. Uh, I think fish oil is, is one of those supplements that I, every day I take it, and I think that the, there's just mounting evidence that it's beneficial. I mean, high dose, it has to be in the right dose for some people, and it's, I mean, it's been shown to really lower triglycerides, for example, mm. but again, there's conflicting studies, and a lot of times when you look at these clinical trials, it all has to do with dose. It has to do with, were they taking a statin, mm -hmm. for example, which can sort of mask some of the benefits. You know, there's all sorts of Gosh, things that are so complicated. complications. It complicates everything. And then you get all this data and you're like, wait a minute, but yesterday was not good for you. Today it is I good know, for you. I know, right? How are you supposed to know when there's so much information out there about medical news, about health news, nutrition news, supplement news? How do you know what to trust when there's just so much news out there about what's working and what's not working i mean it's hard to know <laughs> it's it's hard for, i have to it's hard for me to kind of sort through it you know then you add the list this layer of genetics that's also complicating particularly with the randomized controlled trials like there's genes that people um, have where they actually need a higher dose of fish oil to have benefits which mm. is super interesting there's also genes where people that get omega-3 from the plant source because there's a plant form alpha linoleic acid ala that um, for chia seeds or flax seeds or walnuts, they don't convert that ALA into the EPA and DHA very well. And those EPA and DHA are ultimately what are regulating everything that's important for health. So again, you know, you have the genetics that comes into, and this is also the case for, for studies on saturated fat, you know, the genetics plays a role in that as well. So there's all sorts of, there's so many factors when, when, when designing a clinical trial and I think, I think the burden is on the researchers. The researchers have to come to a consensus right. and, and realize, but then, But then a decade later, they may come to a new consensus with new research where it's like, <laughs> yes. we, we thought, I don't know, leafy greens were healthy, but now it's actually killing you, right? It's like, I don't, not that it's going to happen, but I'm just saying, it seems like over decades, what scientists and researchers think sometimes is accurate, we find later evidence that it may not be 100% true. That, that is true. That is true. But I think, I think when you have overwhelming evidence in, mo in multiple fields and multiple areas, so you have the epidemiological evidence, you have the associative studies, you have the randomized controlled trials where they're, you know, you start and you give someone something and then you measure an endpoint. The, the double have, placebo testing. Everything. Right. And then you have the mechanistic studies where you start to look at how it's happening and you do these animal studies, you know, that together combined the, the whole, mm -hmm. the whole, you know, comprehensive um, literature, I, I would say is, is what really strengthens. Yeah. The like, matrix of studies. When makes every, it a whole. Right. When everything starts to come and point to that direction. I, I have so many questions. This, this one just came to my mind really quick as I, you know, I live in Los Angeles I'm from Ohio, so being from Ohio, you grow up eating meat and cheese and milk. I remember I lived in a, uh, a dorm. I went to, in eighth grade, I went to a, a private school, boarding school, and I lived in a dorm with a bunch of other kids in middle school. And I actually had a milk dispenser, a five gallon whole milk dispenser, and I would drink that every three days by myself. Five gallons within three days, because I thought milk was good. You're supposed to drink it all day long. So, you know, you drink it before sleep, everything. I have a question about being in L.A. now. Growing up in Ohio, which is all about meat and potatoes, now being in L.A., it's all about being vegan. And everything, <laughs> is, around, everything is around either 
keto or veganism or paleo or vegan, it's like you're, you're good, you're bad, you're right, you're wrong. There's documentaries that are coming out all the time about veganism, all that stuff. If you had to um, calculate with your wealth of information and knowledge, who would be healthier, the person who is vegan eating the best foods all day or the meat eater eating the best, healthiest foods all day? Who do you think would have a, a well, healthier- the meat, the meat eater also would be including pl eating vegetables Including well, plants right? and vegetables okay. as well. But to so they're an omnivore. Yes, they're eating meat, but they're also eating all the other good foods or someone who's eating all the other good foods excluding meat. So Veganism taking out all the processed, or, so taking out all the processed foods in both camps, right? Both camps, no whole unhealthy, foods. whole they're foods, eating. healthy. One is having meat every day, a portion of meat, and one is not having meat. Who is a healthier, happier human being that lives longer? Well, I can tell you, I don't know, um, but we can talk about what the evidence has shown. And I think probably the, the strongest evidence to date, most of this evidence is unfortunately epidemiological because you're never going to get a randomized control trial that's 50 years long. You know, I mean, you're just, you're not going to, that's, that's not going to happen. It's too, it's too expensive and people won't follow the same diet for that long. Right. So you won't, you won't ever have a longevity study. That's sure. a randomized control trial, okay. but Looking at the epidemiological studies, um, for a long time, you'd have study after study coming out showing, oh, eating vegetarians have a lower what's called all-cause mortality than non-vegetarians or than an people that eat animal meat. All-cause mortality means basically dying from all types of diseases that are non-accidental. Diabetes. Right? Cancer, type 2 diabetes. Obesity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, heart disease. So, um, so vegetarians die lots less. Lots of studies. Study, lots of studies have shown that, but huh. with the, pro the problem with epidemiological studies is there's what are called confounding factors. So you have people that are also obese, you have people that are sedentary, you have people that exercise, you have people that smoke, you have, you know, right. so what about all those other things? How do those come into play, yeah, right? Interesting. And so there have now been um, studies, large, large studies that have looked at confounding factors and have found, yes vegetarians do have lower all-cause mortality, particularly cancer-related mortality, than people who eat meat. But when you take all the unhealthy lifestyle factors away, so people that are not obese, don't smoke, that are physically active, and that don't consume excessive alcohol, if they eat meat, they have the same mortality rate as a vegetarian. Mm. But if you take the meat eater and you add one of those in, like obesity, then they are going to have a higher, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, a higher mortality rate than the vegetarian. So basically, meat has a different amino acid profile. And part of that amino acid profile can activate a, a hormone, a, a, a very important hormone, but it's got sort of, it's like a double-edged sword hormone. It's called IGF-1, insulin growth factor like one. And this hormone is an, an important hormone. Like, during development, it helps you grow. I mean, it's needed to grow. People that have genetic, um, you know, polymorphisms in, in genes that affect that pathway and have less of it have stunted growth. Um, so it's important for growth. It's important for muscle repair. Like you want you want IGF one in your muscles to mm -hmm. help repair muscles after you know after you after you injure them or after you exercise. Right, that's the type of injury you're. But can't you get that from stress. supplementation, from protein or supplements as well? Well, so this is the this is the bottom line: is that the IGF one, um, which is activated by uh, essential amino acids. You know, you've got like leucine, for example, methionine. It also is important for, in the brain for growing new neurons. I'm just telling you the importance of it because the problem with IGF-1 is that as we age and we accumulate damage within our cells, um, and, we, and this happens to everyone, um, and you have a cell that, it, let's say a cell gets enough damage, it has a mutation that could potentially become a cancer-causing mutation. The IGF-1 that's around, which, hap which is around a lot more in meat eaters, mm. um, it allows a damaged cell to overcome signals in our body that will usually kill it and say, oh, this has got damage. If we don't kill it, it could become cancer. IGF-1 goes, no, 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 grow, keep, mm. keep growing. And so 
IGF it's a growth one, hormone. It's a growth hormone or stimulus. Exactly what it is. Yeah. Um, and, and in fact, you huh. know, so studies, it's going to grow any cancer or any disease. It's going to allow things to grow more. Yes. At 1230, one o'clock, you're hungry. No question about it. If you don't eat by three, four o'clock, that hunger level is actually the same whether you ate or you didn't eat. What happened? Well, your body simply took the calories it needed from your body fat. You took that meal from your body fat and your hunger went down.